Hello, my name is Renee Evelyn. I am an MSW from the state of New Jersey. I am a supervising adoption field support specialist with the Department of Children and Families, Division of Child Protection and Permanency. My action research project will focus on families with international ties and how child welfare staff addresses relationships, either through placements or connections without bias. The word diversity speaks to the many faces of the universe and connections without boundaries allows for diverse families to live freely without bias and restrictions. And that is how I was able to come up with the title of my presentation, Connections Without Boundaries, because as we go along, you will understand what I mean by connections without any type of boundaries. So this is me. I am a proud descendant of the island of Barbados. And when I say proud, I really do mean very, very proud. I have 22 years in child welfare with adoption being the one consistent area. I have been in my current position with the state for five years. And once again, I'm a proud Bayesian queen. I selected the subject that I selected, not just because it's a very important topic, but also I, because I am from an international country, I feel at any time this could be my family. So in selecting my subject matter, I looked at how domestic cases are handled versus those involving international families. Family connections and child welfare are limited due to biases, case practice, and recognition of its importance. The decision makers, such as judges, agency directors, and policymakers, need to be aware of permanency for youth and the fact that it can be obtained in several manners. However, we really need to ask ourselves, do we do the work to ensure its success? I like to point out traumatized youth versus successful adults. We have to recognize that just the fact that children are separated from their families is trauma to the adults and to the children. Just imagine if we did all the work that we possibly could to reunify children with their families, how much higher the percentage of becoming a successful adult would our youth be instead of being separated from their families. As we look at the national shift in child welfare, we have to broaden our scope for planning for families. Nationally, child welfare agencies are moving away from adoption planning to kinship legal guardianship. Specifically in New Jersey, kinship legal guardianship is not just limited to kin, but also now unrelated resource parents and fictive kin. Staff should be knowledgeable of the permanency options and the importance and benefits of youth being placed with kin and or having those connections regardless of where the family resides. So with my PICO, my PICO basically indicates or asks the question, if in fact we were to train New Jersey staff, okay, adoption staff of adoption operations, statewide leadership, if they will participate in training on how to conduct permanency planning for youth that included the procedures and the strategies involving their international family members, would that assist in finalizing adoptions or other permanency options with those relatives? Again, regardless of where those relatives reside. To begin my research, I conducted a case review in New Jersey. I did a review from 2017 to 2020, that was my target year. When we did the review, we recognized that Essex County, New Jersey was identified as having the most referrals during that time frame internationally. I'd like to point out that the staff in Essex County are representative of the community they serve. The community is highly populated by families of minority descent, and so is the staff of Essex County. The trends identified in the review had to do with reluctance to relocate, which is, you know, comfort, and children being reunified with their parents. But interestingly enough, the barriers identified most frequently were tasked within our control such as the lack of documentation and the delays in referrals. 
pointing out, pointing out that in this review, 90% of our cases that was reviewed, there was a delay in referrals and permanency of one to two years. Once the area was identified, i.e. Essex County, a survey was completed by 103 staff members around the myths of working with international ties. Completing surveys was a way of gaining the knowledge of staff's work with International Social Services USA, and also identifying what is working well along with those barriers. And we'll talk more about ISS USA as we move along in the presentation. In reviewing the results of the survey, based on the, percentage, the percentages here, it is evident that the staff agree with international connections and placements actually happening. However, further research revealed that there was not a high percentage of staff supporting this. For those who disagreed, the reasons can be identified as biased and can be based solely on our own standards here in the United States, opposed to challenging ourselves to become a little bit more educated on the country in which we're inquiring about. We're judging poverty, economic status of family members, the fact that the child may not have a relationship with the family, but when we place children in foster care, they don't have a relationship with that family either. And then various factors are considered, including age of the child, the length of time the child's been placement, and the level of adjustment. So we would use the excuse that, well, the child has been in resource care with that resource parent for the past four years, so why would we remove them? The answer is because that's their family and that family wants to make a permanent plan for that child. In New Jersey, we use ISS USA as our international provider. ISS USA is a small nonprofit organization contracted with five states in the United States. Those states are New Mexico, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Arizona. Many other states are privatized and use other domains for their international services. Some of those states do contact ISS for and make a referral, but it may be only for one-time service. I want to also point out that ISS USA, they are not responsible for making any type of placement decisions or permanency decisions when it comes to youth and their family who resides internationally. ISS USA's mission is ISS USA mobilizes a domestic and international network of legal and social work professionals to connect children, adults, and families separated by borders with the services and support they need. This slide here represents all the referrals received by ISS USA during the years 2017 and 2020. The referrals were inclusive of home studies, supervision requests, parenting assessments, and various other uh, little uh, services that we were requesting. ISS USA, they also receive random requests that they may not have even known that they could fulfill. So what they do is if they get a referral for something new that they've never done before, prior to denying the request, they would research first to see if they can complete the request. And most times than none, that proved positive and also assisted them with improving their work. So in 2018, there were 165 referrals made to ISS USA. That was our largest target, that largest year within that time frame. And in 2020, there were only 94. And we attribute that to the COVID pandemic. The methodology that I used for my project, we've already talked about the case reviews. We've talked about the ISS USA interviews. We also talked about the surveys. I also conducted trainings that included pre and post tests, as well as evaluations. Bringing the decision makers to the table during my intervention to assess knowledge and provide further education was an important factor for successful outcomes of my project. To start planning my intervention, I needed to provide training to leadership in the state. That leadership included local office supervisors, concurrent planning specialists, and staff of the Office of Adoption Operations. There were 97 staff members that were actually trained and they were provided with the data that I obtained during the review of Essex County. 
The objective was to educate the participants on the importance of family connections and using the correct process to ensure that children in unrelated resource care are given every opportunity possible at permanency with relatives or kin. We as an agency, and I learned that this was nationally, we go to extreme lengths for domestic families and resource parents. So I mean to say, if we have a resource parent that needs a larger vehicle, if we have a resource parent that needs to add bars to their windows, if we have a resource parent that needs to remodel their home in some way to accommodate a youth, we will spend the money, we will do everything. We will travel, we will have a resource parent travel from Florida to New York for evaluations. We will do anything possible for our resource parents or for our fictive kin. However, we really need to think about, do we extend the same financial courtesy to parents or extended families in international countries? Do we advocate for visas? Do we research resources for the parent to attend a court hearing? When the parent says to us, they are better off there, meaning their child, do we turn around and say, no, they're actually better off with you or your family? I don't know if we do that, right? Participants included staff from the Division of Child Protection and Permanencies who directly influenced the discussion or decisions regarding family connections and or permanency with kin. Both trainings were remote um, for two hours due to the current agency slash department protocols around the COVID pandemic. Here we have, this is an indication that years of experience does not always translate into knowledge. Of the participants, we had 73% who had been with the agency for 16 years or more. However, they agreed and acknowledged that they still required further education around policies and procedures in utilizing ISS USA for international services. There was a pre-test and a post-test. This chart represents that participants gained knowledge on services that ISS USA can provide, with one of the biggest myths being the approval and disapproval of homes for placement. With that myth, staff would go to court and say, ISS USA denied the home or denied the placement. ISS USA does not make any such decisions at all. So therefore we're misrepresenting ISS USA and we're misrepresenting ourselves when we say that in court, when we're trying to explore relatives or parents outside of the country. The gold on this slide represents the pretest, the blue represents the post-test. The numbers in the post-test represent a knowledge gained from the training. So the question was name two services ISS USA provides the correct answers to the question are A and C. In the post-test, the numbers for B and D decreased because participants learned the correct response, which increased the responses for the post-test for the correct answers. Participants are aware, were aware, and acknowledged that biases exist among agency staff. This is evident here in the pre and the post test. Okay, um, so 92% and 94% in the pre and the post test, that's a large number. And again, that is acknowledging that the biases exist amongst agency staff, which they are. After the training, 83% of people strongly agreed or agreed that they felt they were better able to provide direction on cases that involved international familial connections, proving that the training slash intervention was successful. And overall, the training proved to be relevant and well-received by the participants. The majority felt that they would be able to utilize ISS USA procedures correctly in their work moving forward. In the evaluations are important for deciding how to move forward with any subject matter. So it's important that 
when you participate in anything, you, and an evaluation is requested, that you complete the, request, the evaluation. That is the only way for things to get better um, as you move forward with different subjects. So the information was helpful to me for making international referrals. 89% of the participants agreed that it would, that the information provided was helpful. And that's an indication that the participants gained knowledge that they feel they could utilize in the future. So in conclusion, I'd like to share a story with you. As indicated previously, I am from the island of Barbados. And as a youth, as a young, young child, I remember the water at our home not being functional at times. My grandmother, we were the first home on our block, or should I say on our road, because that's what we call them, to have indoor uh, bathroom facilities. Many of my neighbors, my friends had outhouses. So if I went to their homes, I had to, had to use the bathroom, I'd have to use the outhouse. I remember having to go to what we call a standpipe in the neighborhood, which is a block cement with a pipe with a faucet, just a faucet in this square block. Um, I remember having to go and catch buckets of water, bottles of water. I remember going to the standpipe and taking baths just out in public, naked as I was born. And the, the, just, you know, thinking about it, it's, it brings back memories. Memories because that was my culture. That was me. That was my family. That was my friends. That is how we've lived. The thought of being separated from my grandmother or my family because of judgment. We didn't suffer. We didn't skip a meal. If anything, doing those, you know, taking those steps was going above and beyond to ensure that we survived. So for anybody to look at us and judge us based on the way that the country lived is hurtful. And I truly believe that that is how we judge our international families at times with the poverty. What I experienced was not poverty. What I experienced was making a way and not just suffering. And I think that we look at our families and judge them because we can't imagine using an outhouse we can't imagine walking down the street and catching water and putting the bucket on our heads and walking back with it. We can't imagine having a five-year-old or six-year-old carrying a bucket of water or two of them holding it together and getting it home. And even with the water spilling, making sure that when they got home, there was still some water that can be used to cook, to brush your teeth, to wash your hands. We, we have to stop the judgment, we have to stop the biases, we have to expand our knowledge and learn more about how other worlds live prior to making the decisions that we make. In conclusion, we gotta recognize that safety and protection is our charge. In my example, I was safe and I was protected. I, again, I did not suffer. Remember that adults and families also suffer loss during separation. It's not just the youth. It's the adults as well. Keeping in mind, every, everyone makes mistakes. I don't think anyone intends for their children to be separated from them, but the separation is causing a loss in them as well, not just the youth. And those adults, it could be the parent, it could be the extended family, it doesn't matter, it's still family. Remove the biases and judgments that are based on our own standards. I cannot say that enough because I truly believe that that is, that is where we are. Fulfill the commitment that is in the best interest of the family, not just check off a task box. When you're given a case, you check off boxes, task completed, or week is over, I get paid today. That is not what social services or child protection or family services should be about. For some people it is, but it should not be that way. And we have to really, really take a hard look at that.
Where do we go from here? So moving forward with this important matter, I intend to partner with the New Jersey Training Academy on possibly creating a curriculum around international partnerships and overcoming barriers to be included in new hires in their new worker training. There was recently a version in a new a revision in March 2022 in our DCPMP policies surrounding how we utilize ISS, ISS USA. So I plan to take a look at that and see what impact that new revision has on permanency with family or kin, especially as it relates to international connections and ties. And partnerships, we have to bridge the gap between international embassies within the US and child welfare agencies. How can we move forward with reunifying children with parents or uh, extended family in an international country if we're not having conversation with the embassy of that international country? To come to the United States, most people need a visa, they need funds, they need connections, and they need advocacy. That all starts with the embassies. We have to build those connections. We have to have those conversations. We have to find out why parents can't get to a phone and see how we can utilize our finances or our resources to help them get to a phone so that they can call into court during court hearing instead of sending a letter telling them there's a court hearing and then just expecting them to find a way out of no way. We have to do better. So MPLD to me, this has been an amazing, amazing experience. One that I did not think that I would be able to complete. So professionally, understanding that my topic was important, it is important, not just to me, but learning from my counterparts in the program that it's actually important nationally and being prepared to expand on it with my state as well as others. Professionally, it created opportunities for me to partner with other states regarding child welfare and the importance of family connections, again, through the program, through my counterparts. And the need to erase biases because they solved the problem in the moment. That's what I mean by a greater sense of advocacy for rights versus right now. A lot of times we do work and we complete tasks because it solves the problem right now, but doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. And we need to do the opposite, do what's right, opposed to just, again, checking off a checkbox or saying task is completed because it serves the purpose right now. Personally, overcoming fears of, fears of failure. At this stage in my career, I had to realize that it's never too late for higher achievements, especially with all the other everyday responsibilities, the nine to five, the motherhood, the my son's activities, the other community involvements that I'm a part of, it's never too late for higher achievements. And when you believe you achieve, if you believe something is important, I had to understand that I had to keep going. I couldn't give up, um, especially with a subject matter such as this, one that I can personally speak to because of my heritage. I could, I just couldn't give up. I believe in it and I needed to achieve it, not just for myself, but also understanding that there are people watching me. There are people who need my voice in this subject matter. There are people who have suppressed themselves because they didn't think anybody would listen. So I needed to speak up on it at this time in my life so that others would feel the same way and be able and be empowered to speak up. Understanding again that someone is always watching, someone is always listening, and you have to be the best example for others to follow. So I wanna leave you with this as a closing thought, this quote. Not a single effort of yours will go in vain. You will be rewarded for your pain. Your hard work will bring you a lot of gain. That just simply says that no matter how hard you work, 
no matter what pain you feel from that work, you will always succeed as long as you're doing it for in the best interest of whoever it is you're serving. And you will feel a certain, a certain success within yourself and a certain gratitude within yourself. You don't need anybody else to thank you. As long as you're doing what is best, then your job is done. I thank you very much for viewing my presentation.